Um, welcome to this final webinar of the year hosted by the Center on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, or CODE, at the University of Manchester. Uh, I'm Megan Tinsley, Presidential Fellow in Ethnicity and Inequalities at the University of Manchester and a member of CODE. So uh, first I'd like to welcome Herman Gray, uh, Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's published widely in the areas of Black cultural theory, politics, and media. He's the author of Watching Race, Television and the Science of Blackness, He's also the author of um, Culture Moves, Cultural Moves, rather, Culture Identity and the Politics of Representation, uh, published by the University of California Press in 2005. Uh, Professor Gray is co editor alongside Maharena Gomez Maris of Towards the Sociology of the Trace. Uh, published in 2010, also in Minnesota. And he co-edited the Sage Handbook of Television with Manuel Alvarado, Jenny Buono, and Toby Miller. His most recent book is Racism Post-Race, co-edited with Rupali Mukherjee and Sarah Bane Weiser, and published in 2019 by Duke. Uh, he's a member of the Board of Jurors for the DMA Awards. Joining Professor Gray in conversation will be Anna Saab, who is currently Senior Lecturer in Media, Communications, and Cultural Studies at Goldsmiths, University of London. He's also an affiliate of CODE, where he's contributed to work packages on race and the cultural industry in the wake of COVID. His research centers on race and media, with a particular focus on the cultural industries and issues of diversity. He published his first book, Race in the Cultural Industries, with Polity in 2018. In 2019, he received an AHRC Leadership Fellow Grant for a project entitled Rethinking Diversity in Publishing, which led to a report of the same name published by Goldsmiths Press in June 2020. His latest book, Race, Culture, and Media, was published by Sage in 2021. So I'd like to welcome um, Professor Gray and Dr. Sa for what I expect will be a wide-ranging conversation uh, centering on the question, how has the politics of racial representation changed in the past 30 years? So really looking forward to your reflections uh, and the discussion. Um, and with that, I will speakers. Hi, everyone. Hi, Herman. Good morning. Or it's morning here, it's night it here. It is. I mean, our <laughs> backdrops couldn't be more stark, right? Yours is <laughs> right. sunny, LA sun shining through, <laughs> mine's bleak. It's, already, it's not even, you know, it's just gone five and it's already dark. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's really great to have, by the way, everyone, we can kind of, we can hear someone. I don't know if you've all, just make sure you mute your microphones, because otherwise it uh, makes it a little bit tricky to, I think that's it. Nice one. Thank you. Um, it's great to see everyone here. And, and, and from a, personally, it is, it's such a, um, an amazing, uh, for me, I just feel very, very grateful to have this opportunity to speak to someone directly who's had such a, 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 a huge influence on my work. Um, I have a friend, Herman, who's always teasing me because apparently everything I write has a reference to your work, like every other line, which um, I did check and he was annoyingly correct. So um, anyway, it's a real pleasure. And I'm really excited to have this discussion with you. Um, we, uh, we just spent our time in the green room talking, we, we just were, just, you know, <laughs> chewing the fat as it were. We didn't really talk about the format, but essentially what I think we're going to do is we're really, both of us are really interested. I think we've, and um, please correct me if you, you know, obviously if I mis misrepresent your work, but it seems to me we're both very much interested in kind of race, media, culture, and media, especially in the ways in which it shapes or understands the race and challenges those understandings of race. We understand those issues as a matter of social justice in relation to social justice. But then also mm -hmm. I feel like we both have a slight, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but a slight anxiety about some of the ways in which these discussions on racial representation unfold in, mm -hmm. certainly in kind of popular discourse and policy discourse and occasionally in academic discourse as well. Um, so that's what we're going to, I think we're going to explore in the next mm -hmm. hour or so. Um, I just want to say as well, if you've got questions, like to the audience, if you have questions, just chuck them in the chat and, um, and we can, um, as, as they come to you and yeah, we'll try and address as many of them as possible. Um, mm. We'd like to, Herman and I would like to keep this as informal and as um, collaborative, collaborative as, mm -hmm. as possible. Um, 
But um, yes. I just want to start by saying we're talking about race, media and social justice, and it would be remiss not to mention the passing of two really, really important people. Um, personally, I think in your case, but also intellectually for a lot of us, and that is Bell Hooks and Greg Tate the week before. Mm -hmm. um, do you just mm -hmm. want to share like any kind of thoughts? Yeah, thank you. And thank Megan and her staff and you and the staff. And we've been, um, you know, plotting to get together for several years now. So it's a joy to actually have the occasion to uh, chat with you and uh, visit um, with you and your colleagues and the many friends that have joined us. Um, yeah, I'm still sort of reeling from the loss of Greg Tate and uh, Bell Hooks. Um, I went to graduate school with uh, Bell, with Gloria. So we were in graduate school at the same time, in different departments. So it was a a moment of great ferment and excitement and, uh, you know, really inventive, uh, courageous work that she did, obviously. And Greg, uh, of course, uh, that singular voice of his, that singular imprint, that singular vision that he had uh, and his ability to translate it into kind of you know, beautiful language is, is really important. I will say too that um, both Bell Hooks and Greg Tate figure quite prominently in my book on television um, in the sense that, and maybe this is a way that we can kind of lead into our discussion, um, in the sense that um, they were central figures in what I call the kind of conversations within the African-American community within blackness about black difference. And if you'll recall, Bell Hooks was really quite um, a strong voice in trying to think about the various kinds of differences within Blackness that she was trying to argue against a kind of homogenizing tendency, as particularly with regard to representation. So her work in trying to think through and criticize Black nationalism, a certain kind of vein of Black nationalism was crucial to trying to understand what I was calling at that point the debates within Blackness, the debates about Blackness. So her voice was really incredibly important. Um, and Greg, of course, wrote that um, wonderful piece, uh, Cultural Nets and Freaky Deeks for the Village Voice. He wrote another piece called Aunt Mama Don't Like Uncle Ben, which was really a wade into the culture wars. Um, around that were going on within African-American studies and within African-American communities. And so I think they were both very influential for me in trying to help think about the ways in which Black difference was a complicating uh, register for understanding representation, right? That, that they both really understood and advocated for and pushed very hard to, for us to kind of think about the cultural politics of representations within Blackness, right? So that the push for representation was not simply a singular um, bid on, you know, what new images could do. They really were voices that along with others, but those two in particular were powerful voices advocating a kind of difference, a kind of recognition of Black difference as a strength rather than a weakness, as a way forward rather than a regressive investment in social change and social justice. So I missed them both terribly and, and admired their work and found their work really resonant and powerful for me. There was, there, was a, um, there was a utopian spirit in both of them as well, like in the way in which, um, you know, I think for those of us who are kind of engaged in kind of critical race scholarship, you know, obviously a main task is kind of revealing and exposing the ways in which kind of particular Western humanist projects have deeply kind of racist projects attached to them you know yeah. in fact are undergirded by them and 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 you know that's important work that we all engage with and doing that but sometimes it's the bigger challenge is in imagining what you know more utopian futures might be yeah and certainly in terms of bell hooks is like you said you know her kind of you know pretty unforgiving criticism of that kind of nationalistic tendency you know yeah. when faced with like severe racial sexual kind of class provocation it's no wonder that people retreat into our little to use Gilroy Paul Gilroy's term like camps but um yeah. she was deeply critical of that and similar I think um Greg Tate when he's talking about music and talking about how certain genres get racialized I, I forget the project he was a part of about rock what was it called the rock the black rock coalition exactly and it was yeah. about yeah. well you know it's not just about it's like you know 
we can play rock music as well you know we can do whatever the hell we want to do and that emphasis on like how we can better kind of live together and and, and mm-hmm. culture being the vehicle mm-hmm. for that I think is um you know something that is is what you know is lost in the passing of both of those people but also yeah. I hope will inspire by us some future scholars to kind of actually do that really difficult, you know, we can definitely critique and show mm-hmm. precisely the way that power operates. Mm-hmm. But what would it look like? You know, what would a, how, how can we imagine a new world, you know? And, and mm-hmm. you know, that's what critical theory is all about, right? It's about imagining yeah, futures. That's really. right. I think, I think Greg was trying to, and Bill as well, trying to enact in their writing a certain kind of utopian possibility, right? Not, not just, um, a kind of critical distance on it, but to actually perform it in the writing. And of course, Greg was a musician. And so, you know, his various bands ending up with Burnt Sugar, right? Tried to also weigh into the performative aspects of sonic worlds as well. So he wasn't just, you know, a critic. He was actually trying to sonically recreate and move around uh, ways of understanding sound and possibility. So in that way, he was really a critical presence on the scene in New York. But I think, you know, I was really struck by how far and how many people their work reached. I think, and I don't know if that was true in your neck of the woods, but certainly here people found, um, you know, inspiration and models for writing, both in graduate school and academia, in journalism, in both he and uh, Bell Hooks. Um, the outpouring of kind of, you know, love and affection for them has been really quite remarkable, I think. Mm. Um, Certainly here in the US. Yeah, certainly Greg Taylor as well, considering he was obviously operating in a very specific milieu, right? Um, And and the way in which he works translated for those of us who were lucky enough to, you know, get little snippets of his work. I mean, this was pre-internet as well, right? And then the back. Yeah. So um, that's a testament to the quality of his writing and, and Bell's work as well. Um, if we can kind of fucking pull this into, I mean, I think actually that frames nicely what, you know, will hopefully unfold in the next um, hour. But um, we kind of, um, in, in, <laughs> when putting the blur together for this talk, we talked about, you know, the changes, changes in rep- racial representation over 30 years. And um, mm-hmm. I kind of, you know, that obviously, that's, <laughs> that's a big question. No, <laughs> it is I did give you, to answer you, I, to, I did give you 24 hours. <laughs> to, to <prepare laughs> yeah. But Herman, yeah. how has racial the regime of racial representation? Yeah, that's a big question. Well, I've been thinking about that question for a bit, and uh, I think in your opening remarks, I think you you hit on a couple of key elements as, as a way into this. And one of them is um, kind of the field of media studies and and the ways in which race and media and culture have kind of changed over the years and merged, particularly around representation as an object, and the other one around kind of industrial systems and industrial sites, right? And, and the ways in which the industry, the broadcast industry in general, television in particular, terrestrial television in the old days and now kind of streaming, the ways in which those have been the sites of a certain kind of um, both work production logic in the production of, and the, the role of race there And then finally, I think around kind of activism and media activism slash public policy and how to think about um, what what representations can do and what they look like. So kind of unpacking that, I'm I'm taken back really to, certainly when I came into writing about some of these issues, um, you know, one of the profound organizing principles what came out of the Kerner Commission's report on the Los Angeles uprisings, the Watts uprisings. And and one of the things that they did was to sort of say, part of the frustration in the black community in Los Angeles had very much to do with the absence of talent in front of the camera and some labor issues behind the camera. And I think that that was one of the early kind of moments at which um, the investment in uh, kind of parity, production, labor, as a route to changing the images on the screen, as a route to social justice became lined up, right? They became articulated as a project in a sense. Now, I do think too early on, you know, going back even to uh, James 
James Baldwin, but I was thinking about Richard Wright's book on photography, thinking about W.E.B. Du Bois, right? This kind of earlier histories of people attempting to try to think about the image culture and why it matters. So I think the longer historical view, the particular circumstances in which we get to think about representation as a meaningful site of social justice, civic participation uh, became really important. And from there forward, you know, we kind of tacked back and forth between images on the screen and production process. Who's behind the camera? Who's writing the stories? Who's making the films? Particularly on the uh, fiction side. But of course, on the news side, the same thing was happening, certainly in television. So I think early on, the struggle for representation in the context of broadcast television had a lot to do with just getting on the screen and correcting the record. Um, Marlon Riggs, you know, wonderfully shows this in color adjustment when he kind of takes us through that brief history of um, early network television and the way race was, the way blackness in particular was constructed in that space. Um, and then I think, you know, the other thing that happened was as representations became much more, certainly of blackness and difference, became much more, you know, if not um, plentiful, maybe the correction to the stereotypes, certainly in the United States, started to show up with black images on, on the screen. And I think the politics of representation shifted slightly from there, there are stereotypes, there aren't many, to now there are and how are they relevant? Are they authentic? Are they true and false? Are they positive, negative? And we remember we went through that moment. And then I think the other really important moment for me, at least in trying to think about that big question, was uh, the moment at which certainly again in American network television, we had that kind of moment of the cable netlets and the moment of Fox television the early version, Warner Brothers, UPN, and all those little small networks, where the black image and black image makers are now kind of in front of the camera. And the question shifts from so some of those earlier access questions to trying to reckon with what, you know, the range of images are on the screen. And then I think the questions change. I think the academic questions change, the research questions change, the policy questions change and the scene of production in the industry started to change. So I, I think that they demanded new kind of questions. In my own work, and I'll end with this, um, I think what happened was the moment that I think George Bush the first appointed Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court and we came out of that Anita Hill Clarence Thomas conflict was a very important signal moment. And the moment that uh, George Bush II appointed Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell to those administrations. And the reason I, I point to those two moments as a kind of conjuncture, as a kind of coming together, is because it raises a different question about representation and visibility. That the, that the guarantee, as Stuart Hall used to say, there are no guarantees, right? So that the, the, the investment in the image as a route to social justice if Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice are the face of American empire, right, then the questions have to <laughs> dig in from a different direction. It's not simply a matter of, you know, not having any images on the screen. It came, it seems to me, the question became, um, how do we make sense of this now image rich environment? in the context of empire, the context of nation, in the context of diversity, all these kinds of issues that, that come along. So, I mean, again, it's a long-winded answer, but I was trying to kind of at least suggest that the changes are as much about movements, about policy, about labor and production as they are about the kind of semiotics of the image and the kind of textual meaning of the image and the sort of organization and marketing of those images. So I think over that long durée, you can sort of see the ways that the questions have to necessarily change. Otherwise, I think we wind up in kind of dead ends, dead, dead ends analytically and so forth. How about you? What do you, yeah. that's a big I mean, question. We're, we're, I was just, um, I mean, we're in a really interesting moment, our own Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell moment where, you know, the front bench of the cabinet features um, 
three people of South Asian descent and the current Home Secretary who's enforcing some of the most brutal um, kind of domestic policies with regard to immigration, you know, mm-hmm. um, is is herself a child of immigrants, um, and very mm-hmm. recent ones, you know, via, if I get this right, via Rwanda, Uganda, you know, the African, Indian, yeah. African. So, you know, really a family who's really rooted in um, forced migration, actually. So, so it's kind of really, yeah, kind of really, and 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 exactly those discussions. What this is, what does this actually mean? Can can the South Asian should the South, South Asian community be proud of these achievements? To what extent do they represent South Asian communities, so on and so forth? Um, you know, it's a very obviously. There's going to be a lot of talk between you know, and this is going to be slightly anglo centric. So in the chat, if people mm-hmm. want to bring in other perspectives from other contexts, please do. Yeah. But yeah. It's, you know, inevitably, we're going to slide into this. Well, in the UK and US, but, um, you know, in the UK, we've had this, um, you know, it was media, especially television, if we focus on that, you know, it was, we have a very strong public service tradition here. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, for long, for, for until, until relatively recently, we only had like four channels, you know, and, and so we have this multicultural politics, multiculturalism that has a big mm-hmm. part to play in shaping the ways in which um, Britain's kind of minoritized communities um, are represented and recognized. And, 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 you know, we see this in the eighties and it's shaped by a very particular type of multiculturalism, what um, the media scholar Sarita Malik calls a kind of a softly anti-racist approach, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, kind of based on accommodation, you know, rather than assimilation, at least in comparison to some of our European neighbors. And this moment of diversity, so this, you know, this, 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 this term, this, the, the modern notion of diversity, you know, diversity existed in cultural policy here, you know, mm-hmm. for, for, for many decades, but it took a new kind of more reified meaning um, following Tony Blair, the election of Tony Blair and, and New Labour and, and third way politics. Um, mm-hmm. And again, I just want to cite my mate Clive Nwanka, who's written extensively on this moment and um, and, and, you know, that kind of merging of a kind of commitment to social justice, you know, this is following the death of Stephen Lawrence and the Macpherson report, mm-hmm. which, 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 you know, kind of asserted that the British police force was institutionally racist. This was a big moment and, and the Labour Party drove that mm-hmm. inquiry. Um, so you've got this commitment to social justice, but then also a commitment to markets. And so yes. markets all of a sudden become the way in which actually these are the best ways to not only uh, distribute resources, but actually uh, kind of enable, uh, enable social cohesion and mobility, actually. So, it's, you know, it contributes to kind of um, equal opportunities in a way. And so all of a sudden then this kind of, as you know, again, this soft anti-racist approach kind of gets turned into this notion of diversity. All of a sudden race and racism gets kind of removed from the discourse, if you like. It's about how mm-hmm. we can make the media more diverse. And, mm-hmm. and, and this is the moment we're in now. And, it, you know, you're hard pushed. Again, I don't know how many people here, you know, flick through terrestrial TV in the way in the yeah. old days. But certainly yeah. if you do it like peak time, it's, you, you can't not see a black or brown or Asian person. You know, you, it's impossible. Um, right. and, and certainly, I mean, OK, maybe it's my algorithms, but certainly <laughs> on Netflix and the streaming services, it's, it's yeah. the same fact there's kind of an over-determination, right? Don't, yeah, are, yeah. are they using kind of blackface to sell us products? You know, these incidental mm-hmm. characters in these sitcoms all of a sudden are used to promote these shows, right? Um, I think there's right, a right. Policy around that. And so we're in this moment of diversity and, you know, it's, it's and, and as you say, the investment um, in these issues has become a really, Joe Little talks about popular anti-racism in which kind of building on that Sarah Bane Weiser's notion of popular feminism. You know, we get yeah. this, popular form of anti-racism which again where visibility media visibility is really really high on the agenda and you know and it's great that people recognize how important these issues are but you know the way in which as we kind of suggested right at the beginning the way in which these kind of mobilizations and activisms are kind of operating to what extent do they really deal with you know mm-hmm. these structural kind of forms of racism that that we have to contend with on a daily basis um if i could like if i could just ask you herman you know i mean I, this is a very crude caricature of your work but i'm thinking about two really important things you wrote first is your book watching race and then second is your um that piece you wrote subjected to recognition mm-hmm. would it i mean what you i mean i don't want to say that in watching race you were the kind of it was a celebratory tone but you were recognizing <laughs> the particular kind of conditions that led to a very brief moment mm-hmm. where you know we have 
Fox network is suddenly producing these black cast sitcoms in a way that had never happened in American mm -hmm. television. Mm -hmm. And obviously these, you know, these shows, we were watching them in the UK as well, you know. Yeah. I'm yeah. Not, allowed, not sure if we're allowed to mention his name, but the Cosby show was a really big moment. <laughs> sure. Friday night in Channel 4. Yeah. You know, they showed yeah. it. You know, the whole family, you know, my, and we, we'd all come around and watch it, you know, even for us Asian families, it was still a recognition of sure. Films, you know, sure. And obviously, it was an opportunity for my dad to tell me I should become a doctor. But um, but then, um, and so you talk, you talk about it. It's not like I said, I don't want to mischaracterize it as a celebrate, but you're recognizing the conditions that led to that. And then in Subjected to Recognition, which I think you wrote 2016, was it 20? Yeah, around. Something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you open that with the notion that, um, what do you say, it's the investment in the, polit in the politics of representation is waning. Yeah. You're talking about there's a waning in what yeah. a politics representation can deliver. Yes. And, yes. And, and you're talking and you're still, and I, I really admire this about your work, you still take legacy media super seriously because they are still a huge, huge, they still have a huge presence in the media scape. But mm -hmm. then also you're talking about new media as well. And I, I, yeah. And, yeah. and so there is, I can't, you know, if, like I said, it's a crude caricature, but there is, does seem like a kind of a positivity descending into a negativity in terms of what's <laughs> happening now. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell me why? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the, <laughs> the intro and the character, characterization. You know, one of the things that I, I was trying to think with uh, in Watching Race, think about, because that book came after I had done some work on um, recording companies. And I was very interested in the industrial organization of production that allowed small companies in, right? So the, I think what's, what's, what Watching Race attempts is to, remember in those days we were talking about theaters of struggle. <laughs> I, I remember we were thinking about media as places where certain kinds of contestations, as you note in your own book, contestations, contradiction, right, happen. And legacy media clearly was one of those moments, but the industrial system itself was going through changes as we are again, right, with streaming services. So I think the sense in which the upheaval presented cracks, presented momentary opportunities to think about, um, and, and, I, and, I, and thinking back about some of your questions around race making, right? I think there was something really interesting to, to think about we can we can we can address that a little bit later on, but I think this idea that um, it wasn't as much positive as it was, I suppose at the end of the book I'm disappointed because they pulled Frank's place, <laughs> right? Um, but Frank's place got I thought got us closer to a kind of um, resonance, and I'll come back to that in a minute too. But I thought one of the the, the big ideas that I was trying to grapple with was the contestation that was happening in media, legacy media over what blackness means. And I was trying to really pull on the one side, the way in which white grievance, which we again see come back around, white resentment, white grievance, dependency, all of those moments that Reagan was using to galvanize white support against both the state and black folks who were seen as wards of the state, right? As dependent, undeserving wards. And at the same time, I was trying to grapple with the ways in which African-American intellectuals and creative folks and, and um, musicians and theater people were ascendant in trying to struggle over what blackness meant. As I said earlier, thinking about bell hooks, how difference, whether it was sexual or gender, or regional, right, was a very robust part of the Black conversation. And I wanted to pull those two tensions together to think about watching that struggle happen, right? Kind of thinking about television as a place where that was happening. And in that sense, I think the small netlets that were starting to emerge with uh, new content um, complicated the question for me because it wasn't simply a question of we need more images or we need better images. The question then became in this struggle, how do we make sense of the pull toward these images, both in the direction of white grievance? Is it affirming the sense in which blackness is X, Y, or Z? Or in the direction of, of the debates that we've talked about around nationalism, around homophobia, 
around heteronormativity, right, that was happening at, at the same time within the Black community. So that was kind of the lay of the land in which I was trying to kind of work through those moments. And, and Frank's place was my kind of high moment. And I suspect rather than optimism, I think I settled around a kind of ambivalence, right, which you know, some could sort of say begs the question, <laughs> really, right? That you're feeling to take actually a position by, by claiming everything is ambivalent. Um, whereas I think in the subjected to recognition piece, I was really much more interested in neoliberalism and the kind of, the kind of trajectory from that moment in watching race to the moment of kind of proliferation of blackness and difference in television, certainly again in legacy television, but increasingly in streaming services, right? So it was really a, an, an attempt to kind of grapple with what that investment in visibility got us and to try to think through that visibility and the recognition that we were desiring and are desiring, uh, right? Like, like how do those things pull us into the very logic of a neoliberal, lay of the land in which individualism, the absence of the state or the shrinking of the state, the ascendancy of the market, brand identities, right, diversity, all these things now become part of this neoliberal project in which blackness is yet another marker of difference. But the structural inequities that are constantly being reinforced and widened and deepened are never addressed. It's really a question of um, trying to see more images and engage with those images in ways that people, you know, were desiring in a certain way. So I was trying to actually suggest that, that the recognition subjects us in a Foucaultian sense, right? We are subjected to the very logic of neoliberalism through that very desire, through that very production, through that very circulation. And kind of the, the, the pessimism side of it, or the, maybe it's not pessimism, but the critical side of it is that let's take a step back and really ask a very different kind of question, right? Where does the logic of that kind of visibility take you? Where does the logic of that kind of quest and struggle for recognition take you? Where does the, the investment in representation take you? And at that point, I think the questions started to change for me in terms of what those kinds of analytics could do, how they could help me understand what I think was trying to, what was going on in that moment. Um, so that's, you know, that's the link between those two things and where um, I think the ground and the conjuncture started to kind of produce a different way of trying to understand and the necessity for a different set of questions. Um, and I hadn't thought about it until I, I was reading your book and, and you know, this idea that you raise around post-colonial cultural economies, it seems to me, right, um, raise similar kind of questions. If, 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 if nothing more than asking how, how do we understand the work of race making, right, in these cultural scenes and these cultural sites and the complexity that the politics of representation elide, right? You have to kind of pull it apart and dig much deeper to try to understand um, what's going on there. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, uh, a super generous one. I mean, I think, um, I mean, obviously this is so influenced by your work and thinking through together the structural and the discursive, right? I mean, that's, that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the challenge for any kind of critical theory, ki critical theories of media, you know, period, right? It's that, yeah. that's, that's surely the whole point. Um, you know, we can, obviously there's issues of political economy, there's issues of labour and the working conditions of people who work in media. But the reason why media matters so much is precisely because of its, um, uh, you know, it's, it's in the business of symbol making, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, race is that, you know, empty, that floating signifier, as it were, you know, that's where it, it's in, it's through media that race takes its form and produces material effects. So thinking through in and out, the structural discursive through to the structural is, I think just that, that has got to be the project of kind of critical theory of media period, whether we're in studying race, gender, sexuality, class, and, you know political communication whatever you know and, mm -hmm. and again that's kind of what I took from your work I mean I was kind of really I mean I think some of the most exciting work that's happened in our field is from our, the, our colleagues who are kind of really doing work on, on the digital and and the way in which mm -hmm. these digital technologies and and, the, and platforms specifically are kind of encouraging well you know there's no way to um 
be a member of those platforms and it's all about membership and subscription right without mm -hmm. having to engage in that in that pra in practices of self branding i mean it's mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting i've been working on this um, project recently with my uh, brilliant colleagues um, francesca sabande and david hesmanhouch we've been speak quite simply we wanted to interview um, creatives of color for one of a better word um, mm -hmm. and how they how they relate to digital technologies or the, or the platforms they use to make and distribute their work and you know it's it was kind of in, there was you know it, it, your work subject to recognition totally you know very much was the frame in terms of thinking through well what is going on where where we're entering this environment if you like this mediascape where as you say you know kind of racial difference becomes a marker of you know of you know of brands difference diversity and so on um and we found it really interesting what was one of the things trying to is is actually that kind of the articulation and engagement with social justice issues um, mm -hmm. in the context of these self-branding practices mm -hmm. and actually mm -hmm. we kind of ended up kind of coming up with a bit more of a sympathetic view of these people who are really so acutely aware of that you know the kind of the, the complexity is the, the troubling nature of turning ourselves into brands in order to yeah. share our work yeah. better more efficiently in order to such that algorithms pick us up mm -hmm. and actually they and, and you know it, it their, their discomfort was clear when they were talking about that kind of work when talking about networking and actually kind of forefronting social justice issues whether anti-racist feminist you know kind of sexual politics and so on was actually their way of trying to m give meaning to what they're doing mm -hmm. and so that conflation mm -hmm. of producing work sharing that work but also politics yeah which is really interesting. and actually not dissimilar to the way a lot of us academics use our social media as well like we, mm -hmm. we're, we're sharing our articles we're selling our articles essentially to colleagues and, yeah. in order, and in order to mitigate that we end up having to you know kind of hashtag or kind of share a link to the latest kind of yeah political yeah. atrocity that's happening wherever um you know and yeah. I, I find it like um you know that that kind of structure and agency i guess is something yeah. again which i'm trying to capture the dynamics of and the relations of in that notion of post-colonial cultural economy but yeah, yeah, I wonder. I wonder if the. Um, I just worked with a graduate student who's who's uh, wrote a dissertation on um, queer creators of color mm. on YouTube. Um, and one of the things that he was trying to understand was this idea of self branding within the context of the platform's logic, but also the platform's constraints. Right and how one monetizes one's creative uh, work in the context of that platform, and at the same time has to conform to the rules of the platform, yeah. right? And how how people subvert it, how people kind of get around it, um, how people get kicked off, how people reinstate get reinstated, and and it got me to thinking as you were talking not only about his work, his name is Julian Rodriguez. Um, but also about, again, this tension between the structural, the political economic, the production side, and um, this kind of discursive side, right? And, and, and again, not to make them binaries and oppositions, but to understand whether or not we are in a different kind of moment, as it were, right? So the moment of, of network television, terrestrial television in the United States produced one set of possibilities and conjunctures and openings and struggles. But this is a completely different kind of moment with not only the digital networking capacities, but the streaming capacities, right? And so one of the questions that I've been asking myself and trying to understand is, is this, is this a moment of unsettlement, right? Are we, are, are, are the political economic terms of the platforms and their relationships to content settled or are we in a moment similar to that Fox moment, that moment of UPN, the moment of the netlets when, you know, blackness became um, viable and valuable precisely because the networks were rearranging, restructuring and trying to figure out a more permanent structure, right? And I wonder if whether it's streaming and whether it's various forms of um, 
buyouts and you know structure restructuring the industry. Certainly, then in, in the United States, the regulatory possibilities, some of the global possibilities that you describe in your own work, right? The question for me is, it's kind of how to think about this not just in this moment, but over the kind of longer term. And the examples I think of, again, come from streaming, but you know, the kind of, the kind of plenitude of content and the new deals that are constantly announced in the trade presses in the United States about black creatives, about new projects, about new actors, about, right? I wonder if we are in, I wonder how to think about that as a kind of sustained, as a kind of transformed, business model in which those questions about visibility are now, right, the, the, the industrial response has been, okay, we're gonna get some more writers, we're gonna get more stories, blah, blah, blah. Um, or is this a kind of momentary transitional kind of uh, unsettlement? And, and we may see some other kinds of value, revaluing, resettlement around uh, these kind of structural questions. I don't have an answer, of course, but 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 I'm pondering this question increasingly um, as the digital is is kind of moving into a kind of mature, solidified um, industrial system. I don't know what you think about this. Yeah, I just yeah, I just, I just want to quickly say, I just want to remind people, please do. These are really interesting questions that Herman's posing. So please do. Um, say something in the chat if you've got a question or you want to raise your hand please do I was just thinking I can't help but think that when I was an, I remember like when I was an undergrad studying communication studies back in the mid 90s you know that the, there was it was the the kind of the way in which we were introduced to a topic was through um the, you know the, that media executive at Sky News working for one of Rupert Murdoch's channels you know is saying you know in the face of being criticized for you know it's ideological content he says well people are free to choose whatever they want to consume right so you know that was a typical kind mm -hmm. of response from the right to kind of you know especially media studies because people with a critical approaches to media you know kind yeah. of understanding the ideological wanting to expose the ideological nature of media and then you know the response of critical theorists well would be like well we've only got you know you only give people so much in terms of what they can choose from so you know it's it's you know agenda setting you know all of these classic kind of uh, yeah. um, frameworks and yeah. that that stuff doesn't apply that that kind of frame does not apply anymore to i think yeah. the way which media consumption is and again i don't have any answers to this but i'm like you know i'm just like the, when, the more i think about the way in which you know the globalization of television production the way in which these streaming companies are going to these domestic culture industries and plowing money into them to produce domestic productions as a way mm. to engage those audiences you know mm -hmm. because you know netflix doesn't it's not regulated anyway as far as i can tell it can pretty much do whatever you want you know enter any right. whatever territory it wants and produce content for those audiences um yeah and, and and what happens when those images those productions from india from korea from japan you know from indonesia or whatever and then enter you know our particular context in the west mm -hmm. and what does that all of a sudden they enter racial discourses, you know, in, mm -hmm. in back in India, you know, mm -hmm. there might be articulations of caste or gender or sexuality within those contexts, but when they kind of remove, when they're, when they're, when they're transported to other locales, all of a sudden they become part of a race politics, which I just mm -hmm. find, you know, it's kind of really, really, really um, interesting and, 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 and really kind of hard to make sense of actually. I really need to take mm -hmm. a step back and mm -hmm. kind of think about what's going on. And, and this is the new environment. Mm -hmm. And so we have an influence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, okay, maybe that mm -hmm. I've, I've got to be careful about throwing around terms like that, but the amount of choice we have and, and the way in which, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 you know, I, I, you know, I'm sure you have um, kind of a, a load of shows or books or whatever yeah. that, yeah, you know, you're going to struggle to get through even in these lockdown days, right? Um, this is this is where I think um, the idea that we were talking about of the kind of move from representation to making race, mm. right? The the kind of productivity of um, race making in the media. So you know, this idea that as these shows enter new ecological environments, new racial environments, the ways they get taken up and the ways they get kind of exemplified as a kind of race politics, I think, um, or politics of blackness in the case of the United States or the Caribbean, African, American diasporic encounters, right? Like, um, 
it, it seems to me that that's where the question starts to become less about representation and more about the kind of productivity of these technologies and these um, these contexts. Again, not to be determinist about it, but some of the circulations and some of the ways in which they touch down and get taken up, it seems to me enter and leave, right? They move through kind of racial logics that are that are that are operating, right? And so one example might be, for example, the confrontation after George Floyd and the kind of massive global outpouring of identification and sympathy with folks in Minneapolis and folks in the United States, right? Like how that that work is moving around, those images are moving around, those stories are moving around. Um, Steve McQueen's small acts is moving, you know, through the UK, but it's also moving through the United States, right? We gave it a Peabody, we were so impressed by it. And so how does that get taken up as a politics of race in the United States, even as those race politics are different than the ones in um, the UK, right? How do we understand them in relationship to inequalities that they're trying to engage with? So. Um, that's a question and seems to me less about representation and more about trying to think about the logics of race and the logics of difference and the logics of class that these, these you know, content creators and that this content um, activates, it generates, it enters and it leaves. And, and that's why I think um, I started to use or think about television and some of these new smaller creative projects as also technologies of blackness, right? And I think Greg Tate is very helpful for helping to understand exactly what, how powerful that can be. Because Greg was all about trying to think about, you know, rock music and pop music as a kind of sonic extensions of an African-American imagination, right? And so can one think about, say, you know, um, the random acts of flyness as a way of trying to get us to grapple with a different set of questions, not about representations and stereotypes. Those are important, not about parody, but about, you know, as, as I've said in some recent work, about care, mm -hmm. about conviviality, about trauma, about injury, right? How, can we foreground those questions in the context of both these scrambles for streaming and scrambles for audiences and in the cracks in which creators are telling different kinds of stories. So I'm less interested in black people on the screen than I am the kinds of stories that, um, that we're telling and the ways in which they resonate in and out of different kinds of communities and the ways in which they interrupt or reinforce race-making projects as well. Right? And that's a mouthful, but... I love that. Yeah. Yeah. As you know, I love your notion of race making and, you know, you kind of, you, 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 I kind of took that baton that you started, this notion of how media make race and now I'm smashing it behind the head with that baton because <laughs> I think it gets us out of that cul-de-sac that you kind of highlight, you know, where we where representation only gets talked about in terms of visibility, accuracy, truth, mm -hmm. yes. problematic um, terms. I just want to, we've got a few questions here which I want to address and that will move us into the last part of the talk where I want us to think about alternative modes of practice and critical inquiry. But mm -hmm. you mentioned Black Lives Matter earlier. I just want to just, you know, a bit disingenuous because I've been trying to write a piece on this and I'd like to get your thoughts on it. But um, what did you make of all those kind of statements in, um, in support of Black Lives Matter that were released across the board through legacy media, through like the tech giants, yeah. Um, and, you know, they, they would either be, you know, just about the, you know, kind of showing solidarity with, you know, black people, black communities. Sometimes there would be a reflection on what those media would like to do better, or could do better. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know if you agree, Herman, but I feel like maybe even like three years ago, well, I mean, it's 2020, but I even I think three years previous, certainly five years previous, I don't think they would have done, you know, these media are very scared about making any kind of political pronouncements. Yeah. But all of yeah. a sudden there was this almost a sense of we have to say something actually um yeah. Yeah. and and i'm thinking now in terms of which as much as we can critique diversity as an expression of racial capitalism of neoliberalism a business case of diversity a way of commodify a further you know the latest 
kind of moment in the historical commodification of race um, or the history mm -hmm. of commodification of race. But it seems to me that these, the very legitimacy of media and these huge companies is being questioned and, and, and undermined by not being seen to be doing diversity right. So as much mm -hmm. as, you know, we can, you know, and I'm certainly very cynical <sighs> of the current diversity moment, there's also mm -hmm. something going on that where the, the authority of the dominant culture, if you like, feels under threat. And, um, and, and so that moment of Black Lives Matter where those statements were released, I don't know what your impression of those were like at the time and yeah. like now a year or two down the line. Yeah, certainly they produced, um, as you say, tangible, um, expressions of support and sympathy. Um, you know, some took the form of money, some took the form of kind of, you know, diversity courses and training. I think one of the things that um, it seems to me important is their connection to the social movements that produce the pressure in the first place. And that, you know, as these pronouncements and um, as they get farther and farther away from some of those movements, whether they are local movements in Minneapolis where Floyd was killed or whether they are um, kind of more, I don't know, macro level um, statements, mission statements of one kind or another, right? Um, or whether they are deals that Hollywood's cutting with new producers and new, new content. All, all of that I think is, um, and maybe this begs the question, I kind of to be seen, right? I'm, I'm still skeptical to the extent, I'm appreciative but skeptical to the extent that they are disconnected from the pressure points of those movements. And I was thinking um, about this question in relationship to Rod Ferguson's. Rod is an American studies, uh, trained sociologist, but American studies professor in the United States. I think he's at Yale now. But in the book that we did with Rupali and Sarah, B'nai Weiser and Bahala Mukherjee, um, Race After Racism After Race. Rod's essay is very interesting because he gives us a historical context in which, say, the Black Power movement was translated into Black capitalism. And corporate brands like Coca Cola and some cigarette companies basically took some of that messaging right, and used it to do two things, to break away from the movements that produced them and to, in a sense, affirm that the uh, racial divide was being kind of addressed through this kind of marketized version of black capitalism, right? And his argument is that this, this foreclosed a certain kind of political possibility that those movements were around social justice, around normative ideas about equality, equity, inclusion, that they were forestalled precisely because these large companies took the ideas and essentially rebranded them both as diversity projects and as brand value in a certain sense, right? So I don't know that that's going on. I, I wanna think that 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, there is a different terrain in which to both understand it, but also to make sense of it. But, but I do, I am reminded that there were powerful social movements that produced that pressure. There were very powerful people who were in the street around the world. And in a way that could, that's what could not be ignored. Mm -hmm. And as that pressure has waned, as that pressure has kind of receded, then, you know, it's back to business. So, you know, these giant corporations can have it both ways. They can, you know, pay lip service to diversity projects and send money to right-wing um, challenges to the truth regimes of, <laughs> of modern life. Do you know what I mean? And, and therein is that, again, the contestation contradiction um, that you mentioned uh, in your own work. I just, um, Devin Powers here said that the Washington Post did a great analysis showing the vast majority of the money corporations donated went to initiatives that these companies can actually profit from, such as mortgage subsidies. So kind of touches on your point. I just want to address some of these, um, some of the questions, especially I want to think about, so if we kind of, you know, agree that there's a, there's limits to the way in which of representation talk, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and you alluded to, 
I want to think about alternative ways in which we can think. And you alluded to care, which I really want to talk to you about. I just want to highlight some comments, though. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen Allende talks about, interesting the idea of incorporating African and other non-European theatre into the basic palette for an actor would be beneficial. So I guess it's about kind of global inf influences and how we can facilitate that and, you know, kind of undo that white gaze. Andre mm -hmm. Brock here says, I've been arguing, I feel like a radio is <laughs> going through that. Like, um, <laughs> <I've, laughs> Andre Brock here says, I've been arguing that political economy doesn't do it enough to explain digital identity. Um, branding should not be substituted for identity. I've, used, mm -hmm. I've been using yes. the economy, but I'm curious as to whether Herman thinks there are other possibilities. And um, so Herman very graciously shared with me some of his latest writing, uh, which, which, you know, again, as always, was really rich and I spent a lot of time with. And there was um, one quote where you talk about, as scholars of media, we need to start thinking about, we need to write about television and media in a way that takes care of black life and not just black representation, takes mm -hmm. care of black life and mm -hmm. not just black representation. I've noticed this in your recent work, you're thinking more in terms of, again, I think as a way of trying to like, get out of this representation cul-de-sac, thinking about mm -hmm. feeling, taking feeling, emotion, affect, mm -hmm. care, mm -hmm. seriously. And I'm just kind of, I'd really like, I mean, if you've got any responses to those, mm -hmm. please do, but um, it's, you know, it's about, you know, as much, I really do believe that we need normative frames to analyze and make sense of what, you know, is going on in media. It's not enough to say it's all relative. And, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it, as much as I reject kind of discourses around representation or cynical about, at the same time, they're doing something. Discourses of race are doing something. The way race is made by media is doing something. And there is a consistency in the way in which race is made, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the context. There's, a project of like modernity so yeah what, what 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 do you think is the value of like focusing on those i mean how what tools do we need to kind of measure and, and evaluate the effective say um you know uh, the effects produced by particular media texts and so on yeah i i think i i got well first i think this idea of um, the effective dimension of black lives is uh, an idea that I've been talking with my co-author on that piece, uh, who was a former graduate student of mine, um, uh, around, um, her name is Maya Iverson, and it's around the question of what, how the kind of, the image culture, I want to start there, but I don't want to end it. Like, how do we um, become inured become kind of flat to suffering but also to joy in black spaces why are those spaces often spaces of surprise right and 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 spaces of wonder and puzzlement when in the everyday lives the quotidian worlds of black communities they're not surprises at all right so that was one the, the second concern is um of course, not working through the gaze of whiteness. And I think, you know, the kind of, the kind of emotional power of uh, what Raquel Gates calls these kind of quotidian reality shows that are cringeworthy, right? For her, that's the space of a lot of kind of emotional attachment, um, the space of a kind of access to um, black affective life, and yet intellectually, they're often dismissed as banal and dismissed as kind of, you know, distractions and, and that sort of thing. And I think the questions around trying to understand not the, um, trying to understand how the force of inequalities are also have this affective dimension.